have hair and makeup. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. All right, Teresa Warren, let's, let's, let's have it. What is going on in healthcare? Why is it important for us to study healthcare right now? Healthcare um, is in a big flux. I think um, there's a lot of challenges facing healthcare right now. It's especially um, important here in Hawaii. And I'll tell you why. When you're talking about health care, the people who use health care the most are probably the 65 and older population. Now, according to the census, um, Hawaii is the leader in the 65 and older population. And that number is about to go from 20% to 25% of the population is going to be 65 and older. So we know that cost for taking care of everyone is going up. We also know demand is going up. Yeah? The budget for taking care of everyone is going down. There's your struggle. There's your challenge. There's your, there's your um, crux of the problem. So, you know, nationally, of course, it's a problem. We hear it every day in the news. We hear about um, what the Obama health plan is and, and just the, the two different sides, and it's a constant struggle. In Hawaii, it becomes very, very poignant because this is our, our kupuna. This is our elderly population that we um, pride ourselves on taking good care of. So how do we do it here in Hawaii? What should we think about? And how should we kind of rethink this whole healthcare problem, challenge, question that, that faces us today. So um, from my perspective, and I've been a therapist for 18 years, so I've kind of seen, you know, healthcare go through many changes when I was um, much, much, much younger, <laughs> 18 years ago. Um, you know, healthcare was really about the quality of care and really kind of whatever it takes. Over the last 18 years of my career as a physical therapist, many, many things have changed. Um, I think the key that if I were to sum it up in one answer or one word, it would be prevention. And a lot of people think prevention is, oh, you know, eat healthy and eat your fruits and vegetables and fiber. I think that's part of it. But there's a lot of things that you can't really anticipate. Car accidents, strokes. You know, even if you're very healthy, you may still have a stroke. Um, things like catastrophic accidents, of course, you know, you have, you have injuries and um, those are things that are just day-to-day -day things like osteoarthritis, daily living, you yeah? know, and aging process. It's a normal process. So what does that mean in terms of prevention? How do we prevent that? And the, the theory that I think is critical for all of us to remember is do it right, do it once. Okay. I'm going to give you an example of how that plays into, into healthcare. a very direct and very specific example, falls in the elderly. Every year, according to the Center for Disease Control, $19 billion is spent on fall prevention or falls, injuries related to falls, hospitalization re re, uh, related to falls. $19 billion, not million, billion. Why is that? Why is it so high? Is there that many people who fall? Yes. One in three Americans who are 65 and older do fall. Um, the problem is not just the volume of people who falls, but what happens when somebody falls. Yeah? You don't treat them just once. You treat them five times, six times, because when uh, somebody falls, they are not rehabbed correctly. They're not strengthened properly. They're not um, back to their prior level. They're at a substandard level. So they're susceptible to another fall. They're susceptible to being um, weak. They're susceptible for being afraid. So they, their, their level of function goes lower and lower and lower and lower. Next thing you know, you have to pay for long-term care. Next thing you know, they're in a nursing home. The cost of that is astronomical. Do it right, do it once. Now, at Rehab Hospital of the Pacific, um, this is something that we definitely subscribe to. And, uh, you know, again, we're in the business of rehabilitation. As a physical therapist, I'm in the business of rehabilitation. And so this concept of do it right, do it once is really important. Now, the medical model currently is not in that vein. It's um, do it quickly and as cheaply as possible. That's a complete opposite of do it right, do it once. And so we look at costs escalating. We look at people getting... Uh, once you have that first injury, which is, again, an accident, you deteriorate as opposed to correcting it. So at Rehab Hospital, again, our business is rehabilitation. We have created something called the Innovation Center. Okay? Um, that was something that 
um, kind of conceptually came about the ending of last year and crystallized beginning of this year with funding, et cetera. The Innovation Center is exactly that. It's, um, it's a think tank. And we bring together thought leaders. Um, how should we do things differently? You know, the, the healthcare system um, is an old dinosaur. You know, it's kind of the same old, same old, same old, same old, same old. And has been, has been that way for the last 50 years. Doesn't, there's no real um, wild changes. Yeah, and it's kind of this is how we've always done it. So the concept of the Innovation Center is to create a think tank with thought leaders, people who are not traditionally in healthcare. Thought leaders in the form of uh, venture capitalists, real entrepreneurs, um, thought leaders in terms of uh, hardcore researchers, people who are on the cutting edge of what's possible in science. Um, you know, you bring in clinicians and you stir them all up and you create conversation about how should we tackle this problem. Um, you bring in engineers, you know, their, their way of approaching things is always black and white. It's not esoteric, it's not, you know, conceptual, it's very black and white. How do we do this and how do we map from here to there? Um, maybe that's a good way of approaching healthcare. Yeah, very definitive. So the whole concept of the health of the Innovation Center at Rehab Hospital is to do this, is to take this leadership leadership position. And um, the other thing that's kind of unique about the Innovation Center, besides the people who kind of contribute to it, is also the structure of it. Now, um, the technology industry is very unique. And I've worked in Silicon Valley for, oh, about six years and was involved with two startups. And so I understand the culture. The culture of technology is very agile. It's very fluid. It's very flexible. And it changes overnight like the wind. And you have to have that kind of flexibility. Um, you know, so it's almost like if you were to equate it to an animal. It's almost like a cougar. Now. Healthcare is like a dinosaur. Doesn't move, static, heavy. Um, you know, so you have two different animals. The Innovation Center, when we created it, we wanted it to mirror the industry that we're going to be working with, which is technology. So you got to look like a cougar, act like a cougar, behave like a cougar, so you can run with the cougars, right? You can't look and smell and behave like a dinosaur and expect to keep up with the cougars. So one of the key factors for the Innovation Center is just that. We um, structurally work like a startup. Uh, very agile, funds are very available. The approval process is very, very fast. You know, for traditional healthcare, if I see a piece of technology that I think would be very helpful, it takes three years and 18 levels of approval before it can actually be implemented. And once you get it in, then you have to go through another 18 levels to get it to a patient. Um, the Innovation Center eliminates all of that, which we think is exciting dramatic, and probably one of the best ways to really think about healthcare. So within the Innovation Center, um, we have three key goals. And those are seek, inspire, and advance. What do I mean by um, seek? Well, I think it's, that's pretty obvious. The concept of bench to bedside, yeah, when something is developed to getting it onto a patient so that a patient can use it. Usually, you know, in, in pharmaceuticals, that's a, well, 12-year, 15-year process. And hence, the cost of our medication is crazy, as, astrono astronomical, just because of the R&D process. In technology and in uh, something like rehabilitation medicine, bench to bedside can be relatively quick. At the Innovation Center, it is um, once a piece of technology, such as a robotic device, is developed, it's months before it's actually on a patient. Months, not years, months. Um, we are currently working with a few companies in Silicon Valley that are developing robotic devices, and we are in the R&D stage with them. So they'll give us a beta product, and we will test it on patients, provide feedback as clinicians, and they continue to improve it. But the, the key is that our patients have access to technology. That's um, bench to bedside. It's critical. You know, what's available, what engineers can come up with, and how we incorporate it. That's something that we, we strongly and firmly believe in. I'll give you an example of that. There's a device um, by a company called Alter-G. And Alter-G stands for Alter Gravity or Alternative Gravity. And it is um, NASA-based technology. And what it does is it, they created a treadmill that gives you an environment that simulates weightlessness. Kind of what the astronauts do when they work 
um, to train to go to outer space. Right? So we have this treadmill that has, um, I, can, I can create an environment of weightlessness for the patient. Well, what does that mean? Um, for somebody who has arthritis, low back pain, knee pain, ankle pain, hip pain, it means they can run, walk without pain because I can take them weightless. Um, when somebody just had surgery, total hip replacement, total knee replacement, ACL repair, uh, again, I can take them weightless. They can move without injuring, without um, putting the, the new injury or the new operation at risk. Take them weightless. No pain, no stress, no ground reaction forces to harm the surgery. Beautiful. Um, again, bench to bedside. Yeah, very, very quick. Uh, we actually work with veterans. So these are young you know, soldiers who returned from Afghanistan, from Iraq after many tours. Um, part of the job of being a soldier is that you do have a lot of equipment. Um, you do wear these, these uh, body armor that is at least 100 pounds, plus their 200 pound pack, plus their you know, jumping up and down from Humvees. Um, their body takes a toll, just like a football player. Yeah, that, that's part of the job. But when they come back and they're late 20s, early 30s, and their low back pain is severe, their knee pain is severe, their hip pain is severe, how do we work with them? How do we heal them? How do we get them their bodies strong again? The Alter G has been beautiful. You know, we again allow them to work pain free. How do we get them stronger? Pain free. So this is what what um, we mean when we say seek. These types of technology that gives us the window to work with patients. Okay. Um, second goal, inspire. What does that mean, inspire? Well, certainly innovation, just the concept of the word innovation, is about inspiration. And um, when we think about inspire, we think about rethinking what is the potential. So, um, you know, there, we all have our conceptions of what, you know, is possible. And, and I think having been a therapist for 18 years, in my world, when somebody has a catastrophic accident, you know, you're out at Sandy Beach and you break your back, um, you're se you sever your spinal cord, and you're in a wheelchair. That is never going to heal again. You, you're, once your spinal cord is cut, it's cut. You're in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. That's something that I was taught 18 years ago. That's something that I believed and everyone in the medical community believed. When you talk to a patient, you say, I'm really sorry to tell you, but, you know, you'll never walk again. Okay, um, now we actually have been working with a company called Exobionics up in Berkeley, um, technology coming out of UC Berkeley. They actually created a robotic device called the ExoPro that gets somebody up and walking. Now we actually had a gentleman who 27 years ago was at rehab hospital because he had a car accident and broke his back. He hasn't walked in 27 years been wheelchair bound, led a very interesting life, has had a very full life, got married, had kids, um, but nonetheless he was in a wheelchair. Three months ago we got him up and walking with this robot, literally up on his feet and walking. So when we say technology can inspire, it can inspire us to think about, oh my god, you know, what, what is the potential here? What is possible? Certainly without, in, in my lifetime, I never thought we can get a, you know, paraplegic, a complete severed spinal cord patient who has paraplegia up and walking. Now this device is of course very expensive, it's still in the R&D stage, um, but we know how capitalist communities work, you know. Look at the cell phones, we had $1,000 for these huge cell phones 15 years ago, now they're two for a dollar, free with a Happy Meal. It is, you know, it, it's, it's once you have mass manufacturing, it's unbelievable. So when somebody has a spinal cord, they're told their legs will never move again. Well, you strap on this um, exoskeleton or this, this robotic device, and you're at home, you get up out of bed, even though your legs don't work, you have a device that walks for you. So that they don't have to sit in a wheelchair, they don't have to look at everybody's belly button, and uh, you don't have to deal with osteoporosis. All the secondary issues that we know is a problem for healthcare that is gonna be very expensive, you now eliminate because What's happened is technology can optimize whatever, whatever has happened in terms of somebody's health where there's a deficit. Technology can step in and, and optimize it and compensate so that you can get back to an optimal level.
That's what we mean by inspire. And the last one is advance. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Um, again, 18 years ago, we teach people to compensate. So if you have, um, if you just had a stroke, you know, and you can't walk in your week, you um, use something called a cane or a walker. Yeah? And um, so this is what it looks like. This ugly. <laughs> um, this is what you give somebody. It's called a quad cane, and they limp along for their, the rest of their life with something like this. Um, their leg is weak, um, and they start to put weight on their hand. Now, as human beings, we're designed to walk what we call bipedal animals. You walk on your legs. Right? Once you have a cane or a walker, you become a quadruped or a triplegia. You start to walk on your hands um, on a walker, or you start to lean. Once you do something like that, your whole body mechanics change, and it's not optimal. Right? Um, if you're used to walking on a walker, you use your hands for balance. You use your hands for support. You use your hands to walk. Now, what happens if they're brushing their teeth? Their balance comes off, yeah? and this is where they fall. Or if they're reaching for something, their balance is off because their balance is used to being forward, and they're used to using their hands. Our hands are designed to get things, move things, not designed for balance. But when you have a stroke, this is what we've taught them. We've taught them to use their hands for balance. We've taught them to use their hands to balance and to move. Your legs are designed to do that. So this is what we call compensation. And we thought, you know, um, that's all we had. That's the best we can do. So they never go back to optimal. Technology enters the picture and voila, you have a robot. This is um, called the Tibion Bionic Leg. This is actually um, designed for stroke patients or people who are recovering from a stroke. It is a, um, it's a single limb exoskeleton, and exoskeleton means you wear it on top, and um, it uses robotic technology to help you move. The beautiful thing about this is the robot knows and senses what it is that the person is trying to do and completes the task for them. There's a lot of intelligence behind this. There's sensors, there's force plates that we use, um, and of course, a thousand algorithms on how this robot works. Two motors in here, and um, it, you know, it's not that heavy, but what we do is we put this on the leg, and this basically trains that leg on how to move again. It creates security because the leg is held securely. This thing is strapped on really tight. Um, the patient feels confident, feels secure with this. Because this is holding them and the robot is working with them, their hands are free. So instead of taking somebody who had a stroke and shifting them so that they're balancing with one arm or two arms, again, you take them off their hands, you put this robot on, they train with the robot. What's amazing about this piece of device um, is when you put it on, you know, you work with it for about 15 minutes, it's when you take it off, the results are there. Because fundamentally, you have trained the muscles how to get stronger, how to move synergistically, and how to um, recover that pattern that they've known for 65 years, 70 years, up until they had the stroke. Um, the key for us, and, and I think for the industry, is to use something like this early on. If you don't use it early on, then you know you have to deal with secondary issues, weaknesses, atrophy, um, tightness, all of those things that become secondary issues and again add to what healthcare costs um, what, what it takes to treat these people, right? Once you have tightness, you have um, atrophy, it's, it's really hard to correct. Do it early. Do it right. Do it, do it once. Do it right. So this piece of technology has changed how we fundamentally do rehabilitation at Rehab Hospital. Um, it is using robotics and putting it into the clinical patient care, having access to it very early. Again, this is something that we're still doing R&D with the company. When we work with our startup companies, it is a true partnership. We do research with them. Um, we do clinical feedback. Their teams fly out, and they come and ask us, well, what do you think of the design? To what do you think of how it works? To what have you tried on other types of patients? What is the applicability to different types of um, clinical cases. So we do a lot and we work very closely with um, Tibion. And Tibion is, again, a company out of um, the Bay Area. 
we have a robot for the leg. We also have a robot for the arm. And the arm robot I don't have with me today, but it is MIT technology that um, came out of Boston. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, the other thing that I think is important to understand about technology and how it works with healthcare is um, when you have a patient who has suffered a uh, neurological injury such as stroke, the current healthcare system gives us three hours a week for outpatient therapy. Three hours a week, not a day, three hours a week to rehabilitate somebody. That's crazy. That, that's not possible. It, it's when somebody just lost the use of their arm and their leg and they went through a major um, body physical change. Three hours a week for rehabilitation. So, but that's the way the model is set up. What do we do? How do we change that? Um, technology gives you intensity. Yeah? The um, myomal device, which is the arm device, the arm robot that we work with out of MIT, is actually a unit that can go home. You can work with that at home for three hours a week. Suddenly, the potential to change, the potential to recover, becomes much stronger. Um, if you're talking about um, how I teach somebody how to regain the use of their, their um, leg, I teach them very specific exercises. Now, when they go home, do they do it the way that I taught them? Not always. Um, what does technology give? It gives them accuracy. I can set the robot, I can set te technology so that it mimics what I want to be done. It's not dependent on the patient remembering, I think you stand like this and I think you move your leg like this. This takes that guesswork out. It um, gives you specificity, it gives you precision and intensity. Something that we may not be able to pay physical therapists to do because it's just too expensive, but this can take the place. The therapist then becomes the coach the instructor, the teacher, the um, moderator, and the person who progresses. This technology um, can then be the one that actually does rehab. And again, our goal is not to just be able to get somebody up and walking and have them kind of half rehab. You know, they're on a cane, they're barely able to balance, and they kind of just hobble along. Our goal is to get them optimized, whatever their body can recover. The last concept that I think in healthcare. Um, that is not often talked about, but it's something that is real, is the concept of plasticity. Plasticity simply means the body has the ability to heal. And that specifically refers to the nervous system, the central nervous system, your nerves, your brain. It has the ability to heal. Now, the key to access that is how much intensity can you use to train it, yeah? and how much accuracy. Well, if I have three hours a week as a therapist and I don't know what's happening at home, there goes your intensity, there goes your accuracy. With technology, um, if I, as a therapist, can set up the environment, set up the equipment, set up the robot, so that accuracy and intensity are both there, suddenly we can facilitate um, what we know is true, which is the plasticity and the, the ability of the body, central nervous system, the brain, to recover function. That's until your last breath, your body has that ability, even if it's gone through a major catastrophic injury, such as a stroke. Uh, it can't heal. Now, when you look, and you know, this has been proven over and over, but if you look at certain people who have had, um, where resources are not an issue, they're able to privately pay for a therapist every day, how they recover versus somebody who's solely dependent on, um, you know, an insurance system, very different. And what is the, what is the, um, what is the difference? Intensity, accuracy. Yeah. Um, somebody who kind of learns a few exercises from their therapist, goes home and tries to do it, well, they can get to a certain point, but who's progressing them? Who's telling them what the next level is? No one. This is a money saver technology. It will save you money. It will give you intensity. It will help you recover. And it will prevent the secondary issues, the tertiary issues, um, long-term care. I think, you know, currently the medical model is going to opposite of where we should be thinking, which is shorten, 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 less approval. Um, instead of eight visits, let's take it down to six. And this is how insurance companies, Medicare, all that is kind of um, looking to structure it, right? Cut costs. Well, if you cut costs, your long-term 
um, costs will probably rise. Um, so it's a short-term solution, creating a bigger long-term problem. So technology becomes critical for um, actually thinking about how we want to do things. So if you want to cut costs, okay, but you got to add something else, yeah? Because the goal is still do it right, do it once. Two things. Yeah. Um, the first thing is, uh, what's what's your advice to this this uh, program? Um, what 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 would you want them to discuss and cover and try to resolve? Um. I think one is actually being willing and open to thinking about things differently. I think um, understanding what is the role of technology. I think we can always look at the financial bottom line over and over and over again, and the obvious solution is to cut. But um, you know the demand is still going to be there. In fact, the demand is going to rise. So I think there's got to be um, there has to be a way where you address that. You know your your needs are going to skyrocket, right, with a population that is 65 and over that is leading the nation. So uh, when you look at one factor, which is just bottom dollar, well, you have one solution, which is to cut. Um, but there are other facets, which I think needs to be considered. Second point. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, and I may not include this in the tape. Okay. But uh, in yesterday's New York Times, there was a story of a young woman Actually, she wants to be a lawyer, hmm. but her father uh, is a uh, military amputee, hmm. and in high school, she kept thinking about that and the concept of phantom pain, Yes, uh, which is very painful, requires drugs most of the time, Yes, and she, she kind of put it together that if you heat uh, the limb, then you will deal with the pain, and she was right, Yeah, and she talked to experts about it. And She's not a, a scientist. Yeah. She's not even a science student. Yeah. <clears throat> but she, over the years, and she's in college yeah. now, she designed um, a, a prosthesis. For yes. Uh, that, that would uh, heat yes. the remainder of the limb and deal with the pain. And then she got into a license agreement. Yep. And now she's distributing this thing all over the country. This is why I read the New York Times. Yeah. Isn't that, <laughs> isn't that exciting? I love that. <laughs> So it occurred to me while you were talking this morning yeah. that there's no reason in the world why we can't find her. You and me, we'll find her. We'll find her on the telephone. Oh, fabulous. And the two of us will sit at that table. I'd love and it. We'll and we'll ask her how she did this, why she did this. We'll track through the story. Uh, that's, what I, that's my suggestion that you and I can do this. We can do a great job at this. I think that would be. Well, to add to that story, most of um, this device right here, um, Tibion right now is a multi-million dollar company, it's a young startup, it's a very hot startup. The reason why this was developed is the CTO, or the current CTO, had total knee replacement. And he's doing his exercises and going, my god, there's got to be a better way to do this. This is monotonous, this is boring, it's painful. He created this. Um, the, for everything that we do, there was a pain point for someone. And it's a personal pain point where you think, oh my God, this got to be done better. And you put thought behind it, and especially if you have engineers who actually know how to think very systematically. This, again, was de developed by an engineer. Um, it really is where innovation comes from. It doesn't come from a group of brilliant, you know, MIT. I mean, it does, but not always. <laughs> but it comes from people who see a need and who, through their own personal um, motivations, have dedicated time and thought to the process. A lot of, you know, even the robotic arm, a lot of that is not so much an engineer saying, oh, here's a business opportunity. The idea of it is I have a need. I'll give you another example. The guy who, um, one of the main engineers who developed the exo um, skeleton, which is, again, you know, this is, by the way, nominated by CNN as a top 10 innovation of 2010. It is so sexy, so hot. I mean, you get somebody who's been in a wheelchair for 27 years up and walking. It doesn't get better than that. The guy who developed that, um, when he was a student at UC Berkeley, he was actually, he, he had a brother who was a Navy SEAL. And um, he himself was an engineer student, and they were apparently very close. And I guess he, uh, when his brother went off to train as a Navy SEAL, um, the engineer said to him, if anything happens to you, I will create a device that will protect you. And that was a little, you know, between brothers. And um, the engineer got a phone call one day that his brother had been injured 
and snapped his neck. As he was flying on the plane to his uh, brother's bedside, he created this thing in his head of, I'm going to figure out how to get him walking again. And sure enough, the world has something like called an exo, um, you know, bionic leg that thousands and thousands and thousands of people change their lives. It, it's always these very um, personal stories. You know, one of the things that, that I always loved when I was in Silicon Valley was um, a guy named Andy Grove, of course, one of the founders of Intel. Um, and uh, he was at a seminar, and he said to the audience, um, what the world has seen with high tech, the internet, you know, Google, search engines, oh my god, everything's been just, you know, exploding in the last 20 years when Silicon Valley was a farm, and now it's, you know, this mecca. Um, he said, what the world has seen with the explosion of high tech is nothing compared to what it's going to see with biotechnology. And I absolutely believe that. I think, um, you know, high tech, oh, it's faster, it's better, it's nice, you know, but you get to a point where it's like, okay, that's enough. I don't, I don't really need to be any more faster than it really is. Biotechnology, absolutely. Um, the need is there. Um, science and medical um, science has always been kind of an art kind of nebula as well. I don't know how aspirin works. I don't know how antibiotics <laughs> really work. You know, when you put an engineer on a problem, they're going to figure out how it works. And so biotechnology changes so much, and the need will always be there. So I, I, I love your story about, you know, this, um, this person who had a personal motivation. And yes, it's, once you understand a body and you do a little series of trials, yes, phantom pain, a lot of people suffer from it, and it's very debilitating. And if you heat it up, basically you're altering the nerves, and you're altering the sensation. And you can uh, dampen it, or you can actually um, desensitize so that you don't have phantom pain anymore. My God, that's a life changer, right? And it talks about quality of life. So, you know, you don't need to take pills anymore. And there you go. You've saved lots of money. Healthcare. Wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Last question. Just give me a, a, a short bio of your own training and uh, you know, work experience. Uh, then I'll ask you my final question. Okay. So um, I graduated with my physical therapy degree from UC San Francisco. Um, my background um, has been as a neurological therapist. I work a lot with stroke patients. Um, I also do a lot with orthopedics um, and have done a lot with uh, cerebral palsy as well. Um, I've worked at UCLA and uh, worked in their functional gait assessment laboratory. So did a lot of science even in those days where I worked a lot with technology and worked with engineers. Um, I've also done quite a bit of basic science research and did a lot with both um, UCSF as well as UCLA. And then, out of the blue one day, I was offered a um, job at a startup company in Silicon Valley in the uh, network security space. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a random thing. And okay, I'll be very honest, it was during the dot-com era, and you know, you were offered stock options that was going to be worth millions. And so I said, heck yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> and um, I ended up... Um, running operations for two young startup during a dot-com era. One was in a network security space, as I mentioned. The company's name was called Net, uh, Net Continuum, and it's since been acquired by Barracuda Networks. Um, and then I was recruited to do another one called Meru Networks, which is an 802.11 wireless space. And um, that company has since gone public last year. But I'm clearly not a multi-gazillionaire because <laughs> it's been a while and I left both companies, you know, after it went through a startup phase. But um, in the process, having worked with each of those companies, I probably worked with about 60 engineers. And it's um, coming from a clinician to uh, engineer. They're different breeds, you know. As a clinician, I'm... Um, artsy and kind of soft and compassionate. Engineers are black and white. And so in the process of working with these, these hardcore engineers for six years, or five, six years, um, I became much more logical, because <laughs> I was forced to be. And um, I've learned a lot about technology and how technology solved things. So I kind of um, decided I wanted to go back into what I love, which is patient care and what my training is and what my background is. And uh, so I went back and uh, worked 
in a um, in a rehab setting, and I uh, thought I would kind of just you know live out my <laughs> life there. And then out of the blue, I got a call from um, someone here in Hawaii, um, David Wadamo, actually from Cardex Pharmaceuticals, and uh, he and the chief medical officer at the time was um, Sam Lockwood, Dr. Lockwood, and they asked if I would help them run their. Um, company which is spinning out Cardex Pharmaceuticals from Hawaii Biotech. And I thought, oh my God, I don't want to do this again. I can't do another startup. Next thing you know, I'm in Hawaii and uh, worked at Cardex for a number of years as their VP of Operations. And, uh, and then um, I decided again, my heart tugged back at patient care, so I went back to um, rehabilitation and found Rehab Hospital of the Pacific. So stayed there and decided that I was going to treat patients and live a low-key life. And <laughs> next thing you knew, um, I was asked to run the outpatient clinic. And it was, you know, Rehab Hospital has been around for a long time. And uh, it's kind of the oldest of the old dinosaurs, yeah. And <laughs> so I said I'd be willing to take it over if they kind of let me breathe new life into it the way that I saw that I, I was willing and God bless them, they said yes. And so it kind of morphed into revitalizing the outpatient clinic to something called the Innovation Center. And it, it's just a natural organic progression. So that's kind of how I got here today. But it's a, it's a series of events that um, kind of strangely enough incorporated all of my um, unusual and, and um, untraditional path and my background. <laughs> Last question. Yes. So there's somebody out there that sees this tape mm. and says, gee, uh, it would be great to, to have that soft and warm physical therapy kind of uh, life. Mm -hmm. What's your advice to that person, uh, both in uh, you know, the, the quality of the experience every day mm. and also in what, what, what training, uh, what orientation does that person need? So to become a physical therapist, you know, I, I fell into this by accident. I didn't know what a therapist was when I was in college. I, you know, I was having a great old time. <laughs> and I needed to choose a major, and oh, that sounds good. I, again, I've been a therapist for 18 years. It is probably one of the most rewarding professions I have, um, I have ever had the privilege of, you know, being a part of, and that's why I keep going back. Um, I think the main thing is you have to kind of like people. You have to enjoy working with people because that's what it's really about. It's about um, interacting with people. And these people are in a crisis. And so they're not going to be at their most charming. Um, and when somebody's in crisis, you know, they're self absorbed, they're traumatized. You have to really enjoy that. You have to have that part of you that um, understands and want to help, even if they're cranky and they're ornery. <laughs> you, have to, um, you have to have that innate ability for um, compassion and empathy and faith and uh, trust and inspire. So I think if you have all of those um, desires, then it is probably one of the most rewarding professions you'll ever, ever come across. You know, as a physician, you see your patients 15 minutes. Yeah, and it's kind of in and out, and you see a lot of patients. As a therapist, you work with them very closely for 45 minutes, for an hour. You build a relationship. You get to see them go from, you know, where they're just initially injured and can't move and really at the lowest point in their lives. And you see them recover all the way to back into their lives. They go back to work. They go back to their um, athletics. They go back to their, you know, playing sports. Um, that journey is a privilege. And I think it's something that if you have the right heart for it, it is incredibly rewarding. She also has her master's from UC San Francisco, which is one of the top research uh, uh, youth schools in rehab. And so you might want to address the, the schooling as well. Yeah, what kind of schooling um, do I want to get? What schools uh, should I go to? <laughs> There's only one school. I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, okay, so to be a therapist, you know, the, the field of physical therapy has progressed a lot also. I mean, I think, you know, it's a, it's, it definitely reflects um, how healthcare is. And um, the current therapy programs right now are all, almost all doctorate programs. And so it's, you know, three years of postgraduate work. Um, 
you know, the thing that people always hear is that it's very competitive, and it is. It's very hard to get into um, a graduate level physical therapy program. Um, and uh, I think, you know, you, you do have to kind of go through all your prerequisites. You have to get good grades, et cetera. Um, you know, one of the, I, I think the reason why I am the way that I am as a therapist is I went to an incredible school. Um, I went to UC San Francisco, which is a very, uh, well, how would I put it? It's a very progressive school. It's a very, it's a, it's a program that teaches you how to think. Um, it's, of course, one of the top medical um, centers and schools in the country. It's also one of the top research. So you get exposed to um, progressive thinking, progressive um, environments. And so, you know, the, the key is not so much what kind of environment or what school you go to. The key is that you continue to maintain your um, interest and recognize and respect that the field is supposed to change. Um, whether you're a physician, a nurse, or a physical therapist, the more we know and the more technology or um, science shows us new things, the more you should keep up so that you can incorporate and bring the best to each of your patients. So it's not so much the school that you come out of, it's how you approach your profession. Um, you know, it's so easy to kind of just sit back and go, oh, I have my degree and I'm a licensed and I'm a physical therapist and, you know, I know what I'm doing and I, I have these skills. Well, the skills get outdated just like everything, just like my cell phone, you know, my computer. God, it's three years old and it's already obsolete, right? Education, knowledge, same thing. The world is changing. Technology is changing everything. And so um, science changes everything. And what we knew or, or what we knew 10 years ago is different from what we know now. You know, we know about, oh my God, cholesterol is bad. <laughs> you know, that's something that we may not have known before, or we know that, you know, Coca-Cola is not good <laughs> for you. <laughs> but, you know, that's not something that we knew. We know smoking is bad for you. Well, 50 years ago, we didn't think it was bad. So those are things that I think um, the more we learn, got to keep up. Okay, last question, Kim. You know, uh, going back to the first question, really. <clears throat> so you know from PIA and otherwise that we're having this program on December 6th. Yeah. And um, you know, we, we, we can't have more than the, the two moderators selected. Yeah. But uh, I just wonder if you could address the question of whether the average Joe should go to this program. Um, this is a program to talk about the delivery of health care in Hawaii the economics of healthcare institutions and problems in both. And it's supposed to be a very candid discussion on both. So uh, what's your advice to people who would be on the fence about uh, going to those programs? Business people, professionals, people not necessarily related to the healthcare industry. Well, um, the healthcare industry is not an industry that is in isolation. Healthcare touches everyone, whether you like it or not. And it does become personal. Um, every single one of us is going to age. And that aging apparently does not begin at 60s, or it begins at 40. And I am proof <laughs> that um, the aging process is real and it's rapid. I think, you know, for every single one of us, whether it's personal or about our parents or about our families or even about our children, Healthcare is going to be a real part of everyday life. Um, you know, we, so many of us have this fragile sense of immortality, especially if we're younger, <laughs> um, until something happens. You know, I mean, it could be you're in your 20s and you think everything's fine until you have that accident, car accident, and bang, you're in a hospital. Suddenly, it matters that who's paying your bills, how does billing work, how does insurance work, who's responsible for what, and what are your rights? And what are the options? And why are things done the way they're done? Um, that's not a good time to learn about it <laughs> when you're in a crisis. Uh, you know, if you choose how you spend your time, um, and we all have, you know, um, demands on our time, and we have to be very selective about how we spend our time. Healthcare and getting to know healthcare is probably um, an investment of our time that is well worth it. Again, if you understand, it does affect you. Um, it could be 
what kind of drugs you're going to get, how much you're going to pay when you go to the doctor, um, why are the reasons the way they are, why, do you, why does your doctors treat you the way they do, why does your therapist give you the rules that they do, what are your options, are, you know, are different places different? Um, I'll give you an example. If you were to get physical therapy at a hospital-based therapy clinic versus a private therapy places, um, the rules are different under Medicare. You are limited in one and not limited in another because it's hospital-based. Well, how would anybody know that? You know, the more you know, the higher your own quality of health care is going to be. That simple. And health care, does it matter? Yeah. From your vantage, where is health care going? How, you know, it's a moving target, we know, yeah. especially now. How fast is it moving and where is it going? Well, I think healthcare is a constant tension. You know, you have the bottom line dollars, oh my God, it's exploding. Um, financially, um, you know, it is, the, the, the cost is escalating. And it's going to escalate as your 65 and older population really starts to boom. Um, so that's one part of the tension. The other tension is, when we think about quality of care, we think about wellness, we think about well-being, we think about, you know, this is not a population that is going to be okay with, well, the doctor says I'm, you know, not going to ever walk again, and so I'm just going to stay at home and watch TV. Well, that's not going to happen. So you have this massive tension that is happening and a massive struggle of financial demands and wellness quality demands. So. It, it fluctuates, it moves, depending on who's the loudest, who's screaming the most. But those two are real factors. I mean, you know, um, the concept of wellness, you, you, a perfect example, alternative medicine, what they call complementary alternative medicine, or CAM. It is growing astronomically fast. Why? Because people want quality of care, quality of life, wellness. Acupuncture, you know, aromatherapy, massage. Um, those are things 30 years ago, kind of poo-pooed as, oh, well, I don't know, it's kind of out there. Um, it may not be proven as strongly as basic science is, but yet people embrace it. Insurance companies are paying for it, for God's sakes, you know. Why? Prevention, wellness, quality. Um, there is probably a lot of validity to it that we have yet to really prove, but what little there is, it's, it's going along the, way, the, the vein of wellness. And so um, that is going to rise and continue to pressurize, whereas you're trying to pressurize and decrease the cost, but you're actually increasing it in other areas. So the spending on, I think, complementary alternative medicine has been just through the roof. So, you know, one way or the other, um, quality is not going to go down, and cost is not going to go down. So what is that tension? And, um, you know, in my... In my humble opinion, it's not only two factors. You have one more factor, which is technology. And technology um, almost becomes the answer, right? If you can incorporate it correctly, if you can really use it intelligently and wisely so that it doesn't decrease quality but decreases cost, well, then you've made the two conflicting sides um, satisfying. So I, I actually think I agree with Andy Grove, and uh, you know I mean he's a <laughs> head of Intel. So uh, biotechnology really has um, a lot of uh, merit in solving this massive tension between wellness, quality of care, and escalating cost. Thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. That was great. Good. <laughs> I can do a lot with that. Good. I'm glad.